It is for these reasons that I regard the decision last year to shift our efforts in space from low to high gear as among the most important decisions that will be made during my incumbency in the office of the presidency. In the 1960s, NASA was operating as a very non-typical U.S. agency, fighting to assert the United States' dominance in the race to space. It all started with President John F. Kennedy's 1962 speech to Rice University. A fire was ignited to achieve what was once thought of as impossible just a few years prior. Great feats were accomplished in a short period of time, and NASA had established itself positively in the eyes of the government and the citizens of the United States. Beginning with the attempt and success of the moon landing in 1969, NASA began expanding their space program, high on the adrenaline of their massive success. Along with completing the seemingly impossible, the triumph also occurred over the Soviet Union, silencing them in the space race and claiming a victory for the United States. NASA started the shuttle program in 1972, beginning with their construction on what would become Columbia, the first successful shuttle in the program, and the first reusable craft to enter space and make it back in one piece. A second shuttle began development, the Shuttle Challenger. The triumph of the Challenger began after its first mission in 1983. The spacecraft was the first to have spacewalks with jetpacks and even pulled a satellite out of orbit to repair and then launch it again. The shuttle saw the mission of the first American woman in space, Sally Ride, who made her mark in space and the world. Through all of its success, the Challenger began seeing problems in the mechanics. I was at home watching it on television, and uh, I watched, normally when they had flights, I would watch the first minute or so on the TV and then run outside and look at it in the sky. I watched it on television, and when the newscaster hesitated and said, that must be the first stage falling away. It didn't look like a first stage to me because I had watched several uh, launchings before. It, the plume was too wide, too full, and it uh, went off to the right in a funny way, and it helped. It stayed longer in the sky than normal. It would have started to drop. It didn't. I knew something was wrong. Engineers at NASA saw a failure occurring in the O-rings of the craft and promptly began trying to solve this issue. But because of the backups put in place, that quickly went to the back burner as the launches being demanded of the shuttle work stream. And there was no time to sit down and truly figure out how to fix it. The night before the launch, Bob Elbing, Alan McDonald, and four other engineers noticed a problem. They refused to sign the launch recommendation due to a safety concern. They were concerned with the structural integrity of the O-rings, the seals between each of the fuel cells and the rockets against the unusually cold weather. I don't even think they knew what was happening right away. I don't think they realized that it had actually exploded. On January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded 73 seconds into its launch, killing all seven crew members, Krista McAuliffe, Gregory Jarvis, Judy Resnick, Dick Scobie, Ronald McNair, Michael Smith, and Ellison Ozuka. The spacecraft disintegrated over the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Cape Canaveral, Florida. The mission would have been a momentous occasion, marking both the 10th mission of the Space Shuttle Challenger and the 25th mission of the Space Shuttle Program. The entire launch was broadcast on live television, with millions watching from their homes. Schools even halted morning lessons to watch the shuttle take flight. They showed the crowds and the bleachers, all the astronauts' families and Krista McCullough's family. The whole country and the whole world were in shock when that happened. The largest pieces of that debris, no bigger than two feet wide and under ten feet long. That is all that remains tonight of seven hero pioneers and tons of high tech. Among the crew members was Krista McAuliffe, a New Hampshire educator, a civilian who had been selected to fly NASA's teacher in space program. She would have been the first civilian in space had the mission been successful. And they had pumped this one up so much because there was a teacher on board. They, I think it was NASA's way of showing people that space is for the common man slash woman. They put a 
female teacher up and she was going to teach a lesson to the students from space. I think this was a way to encourage students to go into science and math, uh, just like we're doing today, and, and uh, encourage taxpayers to fund NASA so that they could do this. It was around 2 degrees Celsius that fateful morning, 15 degrees lower than any recorded space launch, and a record low in the area. Their fears came true and the shuttle broke apart. The citizens of the United States were devastated. President Ronald Reagan postponed his State of the Union address to give a solemn speech, calling the crew members heroes and describing the incident as one of the greatest tragedies in U.S. history. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. The reputation of NASA was permanently ruined, or so it seemed. A miracle was going to have to happen if they could ever gain the trust back of the government and the people. NASA took time off soon after to rebuild themselves as an organization. The shuttle program launched their first shuttle after the incident in 1988 after taking a two-year leave to heed the advice of the engineers and to fix the remaining shuttles in the program. The hiatus also allowed time to grieve over the losses of human life. The relaunching of the shuttle program came with longer prep periods and extensive analysis of the spacecraft before the launch to ensure all operations would work smoothly and efficiently. Launches were scheduled farther out from each other, allowing upkeep on the craft and to prevent neglect of an engineering problem were to occur. The United States government finally stepped in and began to limit NASA's freedoms and provide regulations that not only improved safety, but now made NASA operate more like a standard government agency. Beyond the stability of the aircraft and the organization, the astronauts' safety was put at the forefront of recovery after the shuttle Challenger. Disaster training was established and astronauts began to be taught how to look for engineering mishaps that might happen during launch and re-entry to provide an immediate report and communication between home base and the shuttle. These steps were taken to keep the shuttles and the astronauts safe. A death from a failure in the inner workings of the shuttle hasn't occurred since the Challenger exploded over 25 years ago. The Shuttle Columbia was the second and last shuttle to see devastation similar to the Challenger. The shuttle that had been first and running successfully since the launch in the 1980s saw damages from wind and debris while in orbit and burned up on re-entry into the atmosphere. Seven more lives were lost in the tragic accident that wasn't caused by human error, but pure unsightly luck. The devastation allowed for even more safety be to be added to the shuttles, including cabin depressurization on re-entry. Through trials and tribulations of operating for over half a century, the death toll from the spacecraft malfunction has been 18 and has remained the same since 2003. The shuttle program was later ended in 2011. NASA through all of this has taken responsibility for their faults and were still able to gain back the trust and hearts of the citizens of the U.S., saving the shuttle program and allowing continual advances in the field of space exploration that still continues to this day. NASA is focusing more and more on research, aiming to gain further knowledge about our solar system and space. Commercial spaceflight has turned private, and this has allowed better funding, better technology, and better spacecrafts to enter in and out of our atmosphere. This has also allowed companies other than NASA to send missions into space, such as Elon Musk's Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX. Apart from selective missions, the projection to have civilians in space places future space tourism around $34 billion by the year 2021. The triumph before and after the tragic accident on that day in 1983 was able to provide advancements in safety and exploration for decades after.